This is Shanghai, the historic port on the Yangtze River, China's greatest city. I had arranged to meet the American author James Bradley, whose latest best-selling book, The China Mirage, reveals an extraordinary hidden history of American power and modern China. It was almost illegal for someone like me to know a Chinese for almost all of American history. The Chinese came to America to mine gold and build the railroads, and Americans decided we didn't like the competition. So in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which kept the Chinese out of the United States for about 100 years. So you have the largest population in the world that can't come to the United States. So at just the point we're putting up the Statue of Liberty saying we welcome everybody, we were erecting a wall saying we welcome everybody except those Chinese. Fear of a rising China today is the latest chapter in a history of propaganda that presented the Chinese as uncouth and infantile. To Western popular and political culture, the Chinese became the yellow peril, and racial stereotypes bore the constant theme of fear and threat. Boris Karloff as the evil Fu Manchu. His passion for power twisting his brilliant mind as he revels in the horrors of human sacrifice and torture. Behind the mask of Fu Manchu. This caricature of an entire people concealed another agenda, opium. For the American elite in the 19th century, China was a gold mine of drugs. Warren Delano, the grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer, second to the British. He welcomed the first American ship into China to help out with the opium wars. Uh, much of the east coast of America, Columbia, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, were born from uh, opium money. The American Industrial Revolution was funded by huge pools of money. Where did this come from? It came from illegal drugs in the biggest market in the world, China. Let me get this right. The grandfather of arguably the most liberal president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a drug runner. Yes, sir. Franklin Delano Roosevelt never made much money in his life. He had public service jobs that were very lowly paid, but he had yachts, he had summer homes, he had mansions in New York City, the kids went to private schools. He inherited a fortune from Warren Delano, his father, who was the American opium king of China. If you scratch anyone with the name Forbes in, in their name, John uh, Forbes Carey, Secretary of State John Forbes Carey. That's the present Secretary of State. Yes, sir. You'll find opium money. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. How big was opium money? Opium money built the first industrial city in the United States, Lowell, Massachusetts. It built the first five railroads in the United States. Opium money all over the East Coast, but it wasn't talked about. It was called the China trade. And if you go to various museums, you can see teas and silks uh, uh, exhibited, and they keep quiet about all that big opium money. In the scramble to get opium money, China was invaded and colonized by Britain and the other imperial powers. Foreign armies grabbed whole swathes of China this is the American army in Tiananmen Square, Peking, in 1900. Great cities like Shanghai were taken over and declared concessions, and foreigners lived a life of privilege and luxury amidst terrible poverty imposed on the Chinese.
a resistance known as the Boxer Rebellion was put down with the savagery. This rape of China set the tone for how China was perceived in the West well into the 20th century. This is the distinguished historian Theodore H. White, an advisor to the White House, speaking in the 1960s. Perhaps China is too vast to be governed by mercy. Yet if Chinese mind craves order, they must be brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The most difficult task in the world is to reach the minds of men who hate you. What White was really complaining about was the loss of a China that the Imperial West could dominate and the defeat of General Chiang Kai-shek who with his famously powerful Christian wife, Mei Ling Sung, guarded America's interests in China. That is, until they were thrown out in 1949 by a communist revolution led by Mao Zedong. Mao had beaten Chiang Kai-shek three times in huge battles involving millions of combatants. Mao was a winner in this contest from the early 1930s on, but we knew very little about it, and people don't understand that even today. Shanghai hears the message clearly as foreign businessmen board up their shops. Go now, go quickly, for communism marches. Take what you can, but flee. In pell-mell haste, the Western powers evacuate the city they have built, for good and bad alike must leave. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye, as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence, and farewell to a century. Even today, it's difficult to understand the paranoia ignited by Mao's revolution. As we look at China on the map, we can see that China is the basic cause of all of our troubles in Asia. To the long -suffering this is Eric world. Lee, a Shanghai entrepreneur, educated success, in America, and typical of a failed. new, confident, outspoken time, political deny. class. Now in China, uh, there are a lot of problems, uh, but at the moment, the Chinese, the party state, has proven an extraordinary ability to change. I mean, I make the joke how in America you can change political parties, but you can't change the policies. In China, you cannot change the party, but you can change policies. <laughs> uh, so in the 65 or 66 mm -hmm. years, China is being run by one single party, yet the, the political changes that have taken place in China in this past 66 years uh, have been wider and broader and greater than probably any other major country in modern memory. So in that time, China ceased to be communist. Is that what you're saying? Well, China is a market economy, and it's a vibrant market economy, but it is not a capitalist country. Here's why. There's no way a group of billionaires could control the Politburo as billionaires control American policymaking. So in China, you have a vibrant market economy, but capital does not rise above political authority. Capital is not, does not have enshrined rights. In America, capital, the interest of capital and capital itself has risen above the, na the American nation. The political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China is not. The Japanese island of Okinawa is occupied by 32 military installations. From here, the United States has attacked Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Afghanistan, Iraq. The sky is full of planes and helicopters. Where 
wherever people go, they are fenced in and told to keep out. Okinawa is the front line of a beckoning war with China. This is the center of an empire that never speaks its name, whose power is represented in this extraordinary world map of American military bases. Four thousand bases in the United States, almost a thousand bases spread across every continent. The archipelago of empire, uh, the bases that we have around the world, hidden in plain sight, are the the real territory of our empire. Uh, but at the same time, we maintain independent governments in Japan or South Korea or Germany. Uh, they don't have autonomy when it comes to foreign policy. So it's a very sophisticated and effective system, uh, where whereby we pat ourselves on the back for. Uh, helping to midwife uh, democracy in Japan and Germany and South Korea and various other places, while keeping the lid on uh, in, in that we don't know what these countries would do if they were fully independent. And, and the beauty of this system is that most people pay no attention to it at all. They think it's just a natural occurrence to have uh, 50,000 American troops in, in Japan. The, there's no country that has better anti-imperial uh, cred than uh, the United States, and we are not trying to recreate the glories of the, uh, the British Empire. We're arguing that the world is round. We have a global policy, and all nations have global rights. No ocean has ever been dominated the way the U.S. dominates the Pacific. Navy and Air Force, uh, they claim at, in the uh, Pearl Harbor headquarters of the uh, Pacific Command, they claim to be responsible for 52% of the Earth's uh, surface. And when you look at their uh, logo, it shows uh, an eagle over the Aleutian Islands with one tail on coming down somewhere near Seattle and the other coming down right over Beijing. So uh, Beijing uh, looks at a network of bases, a real archipelago of empire that's been built up since the Korean War. You have had, and still have, an arc of, of bases that start in Australia and go through the no. Pacific. We have no bases in Australia. You have Pine Gap, you have Darwin, and you no. have a new facility in Western Australia. No, uh, to speak precisely, we, we have no military bases in Australia. What we do is uh, operate with and in Australian bases, yeah. but we're not in the basing business nowadays. There's a growing collection of what are referred to as lily pad bases. Mm. Um, these are bases that have typically two, three hundred troops, um, no family members, very few amenities and are often quite secretive. They're bases that are frequently constructed within a foreign country's base to disguise it um, and, and generally are not referred to as bases. Many of these bases have been set up to combat China's worldwide economic influence. From these bases, the United States operates a secret army in 147 countries. If you're going to be a free country rather than give in to every gangster regime in the world, you're going to have to take a risk because those gangsters, they want to, they, they want to eliminate good people in the world so they can, uh, uh, and, and in China, they want to dominate all of, the, all of the Far East. They want to dominate, just like Japan wanted to before World War II, their goal was to dominate that part of the world. Today, the, because there has been no political reform in Beijing, these guys want to dominate a huge chunk of the planet. Twilight struggle. Andrew Krupenovich served on America's Soviet National CIA Defense Panel. He's a military strategist and war planner. You've written that airstrikes and naval blockades have a, a role to play in punishing China. You've described the need for sea mines 
You've described the need for special forces, U.S. special forces, and missiles placed in islands. This sounds like a preparation for war. Um, our, our first president, George Washington, said, if you want peace, prepare for war. And essentially, uh, what the United States is doing, again, is responding to provocative behavior uh, on the part of China. And just as we did in the Cold War, the idea was uh, to have a position of military strength such that your adversaries were not tempted to act uh, in aggressive ways or try and employ coercion to get their way. I mean, just last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer into the mm -hmm. Spratly Islands, the South China Sea. And what was different about this, I think, was that Chinese fighters scrambled. That sounds like an escalator. Well, the, uh, again, from an American perspective, the, the escalation was the Chinese beginning to militarize these islands in the first place, uh, moving uh, its military capabilities down into that region, uh, engaging in provocative behavior against uh, the commercial activities and, and military um, forces of, of other minor countries in the region that have claim to those islands. Mm -hmm. So it's a response to Chinese intimidation. Uh, rather, uh, excuse me. How how is commerce being intimidated in the South China Sea? There have been no military mm. forces, no military bases there. Uh, the Chinese, except the United States military base, not in the South China Sea, well, and not even in, in the Philippines, in, in, because the United States withdrew its forces in the Philippines. But the United States is back in the Philippines. The Philippines and the United States have announced five different locations scattered all throughout the Philippines where U.S. troops will be stationed on a rotational basis. This threat to China from yet more U.S. bases on its doorstep was not an issue when an arbitration tribunal ruled against China's claims to the strategic Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. In 2015, the U.S. Navy rehearsed a blockade that would cut China's lifelines of oil and trade and raw materials. The danger of confrontation grows by the day. The US Navy is on the doorstep of China, regardless of disputed islands, and is there with low draft ships, planes, mm -hmm. battle groups. It's right on the doorstep. What if Chinese ships, what if the equivalent was off California? Well, John, we ask ourselves that question regularly, and it's, it's important to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Yeah. Uh, so, look, we don't operate in the Pacific in an effort to scare China, to contain China, to backfoot China. Our operations uh, and our presence it, first of all, is warmly welcomed by the vast majority of the coastal states. But secondly, is fully accepted by the Chinese. Time after time... Is it, excuse me, is it fully accepted? Yes. My impression... By their, by their words. The Chinese My impression leaders, is that they're scared. And this is what they're scared of. A noose of bases right around China. Missiles, bombers, drones, warships, a provocation of war. Today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Under Obama, nuclear warhead spending has risen higher than under any president since the end of the Cold War. It's all a magician's show because at the same time that Obama is talking about that, not only is he spending a trillion dollars to modernize U.S. nuclear forces, but he's deploying these missile defense systems to encircle Russia and China, which makes it impossible to get rid of nuclear weapons in that climate. Everybody wants to look like they're tough. See, I got to be tough. I got to show you, I, you know, I'm not afraid of doing anything military. I'm not afraid of threatening. I'm, you know, I'm a hairy chested gorilla. And, uh, you know, and you don't want to look like you're weak. So what you do is you talk more and more aggressively. 
and uh, and you let and if you don't want to do it yourself because you maybe think it doesn't look very presidential you let somebody under you do the talking and we have gotten into a state the United States has gotten into a situation where there's a lot of military uh, you know saber rattling yeah. and it's really being orchestrated from the top yeah this seems incredibly dangerous all of this that's an understatement i think but i agree yeah. <laughs> when you routinely plan for mass murder you become conditioned to it that's what this is we accept it oh yeah we have we have nuclear weapons the defense secretary he's just announced that there will be warships and special forces and planes sent to the philippines and the wall street journal has described this as the vanguard of a major U.S. presence in Southeast Asia. That sounds like... Where does this end? What's the, what's the purpose? I mean, where are we going to stop this process before it starts a war? And then if the war starts, where does that end? The scientific studies that I teach by the scientists that predict that the Earth can be made essentially uninhabitable from nuclear war, the scientists have been begging the Obama administration, well, they wouldn't say begging, but they've made multiple requests to meet with them and discuss these predictions because they're peer-reviewed studies and they've been turned down over and over again. They've been peripherally told that, well, we don't think uh, the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are all that important if the immediate effects of nuclear war don't stop it. But the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are liable to wipe out the human race. In one exchange, nuclear exchange between the U.S. and China, what could be the consequences? Well, let me just give you an example of what one Chinese four or five megaton warhead would do to a city in the United States. If it got through, uh, the detonation of that weapon over a city would instantly ignite about six or seven hundred square miles on fire. And, and within 20 to 30 minutes, all of those fires would coalesce into a single gigantic firestorm. There would be no escape from it, so all the people there would perish. So the U.S. with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons on Chinese cities. Well, when you combine all the smoke from these nuclear weapons detonating. It actually creates millions of tons of smoke, black carbon smoke, will rise above cloud level into the stratosphere. It's heated by the sun, it acts like a solar collector. And that smoke, because of that, will stay there for 10 years or longer. And what the smoke does is it blocks warming sunlight from reaching the surface of the earth. And it becomes so cold in a matter of just a couple of weeks that will, the temperatures will fall below freezing every day for one to three years. And it will become too cold to grow food crops for at least 10 years or longer. I mean, there's, there's like a total disconnect with the changing world. You have a giant rising power, in this case, China. Why would you expect a giant rising power to not want to have more control over its destiny? What we should be doing, in my view, is trying to cultivate a sense of uh, friendship and cooperation, and we can have our differences with them. If we think they're doing something in trade that we don't like, let's have it out with them. But this saber rattling is the worst thing we can possibly do. It is time to show the whole world that America is back bigger and better and stronger than ever before. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories.
but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. It's the greatest theft in the history of the world. The new president, Donald Trump, has a problem with China. The urgent question now is, will Trump continue with the provocations revealed in this film and take us all to the edge of war? There never have been two countries more interdependent on each other than China and the U.S. in history. Uh, and China is the largest trading nation in the world and in history. So China's economy and, and, and their society and their lives are, 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 are linked to the entire world, including America and the West and all, and all the other countries. So, so I think interdependence between these two countries and among all the nations of the world uh, speak to peace. We don't have to accept the word of those who conjure up threats and false enemies that justify the business and profit of war if we recognize there is another superpower. And that's us. Ordinary people everywhere, like the people of Okinawa, Jeju Island, the Marshall Islands, China, the United States. By speaking out, they deliver a warning to all of us. Can we really afford to be silent? Again, don't know.